Thanks, Peter. All right, so I'll say the good morning again. Um, and the fact that I'm motivating the next three days of the workshop, so this may be something good for someone to watch if they miss day two and want to show up for day three and day four. Um, I'm going to steal from myself a metaphor that I used recently at a, a UK computational biology meeting, which is, from our perspective, you know, many of you or many of your users are looking for the fountain of knowledge. You know, you're, so you're doing the deep learning and, and the analysis and the results and, and trying to find something. Um, to a large degree, what we work on are the reservoirs of information. So we try to give you everything you need to then go off and find this uh, fountain of knowledge to pump it full of water. Um, but of course, there are also details kind of under the scenes. Click, please. Thank you. Uh, kind of the, the dirty laundry of getting water from point A to point B to, to make all of this happen. So if a lot of what we saw on day one was about Omero and IDR and Glenco talking about their installations of Omero Plus. Um, what we really need to do is spend some time on the next three workshops, just kind of looking at the pipes. So dealing with the details and actually doing the work of, of getting water from point A to point B. So hopefully that's um, of interest to many of you. There's more that, we, that needs to be discussed across the board. But for the moment, we are spending uh, our effort, sorry, Matthew's actually already seen this presentation, on answering kind of this one question, which comes down to, um, you can upload your files, obviously, to one of these repositories, get it into the repository of information. Um, your users then are left within the situation that when they download the data, they must then do, you know, they must use bioformats. They must somehow transform the data into something that they can access. Um, and the question we want to ask is, is it not possible for us to come up with a way as a community to let people, when they access the data, to, to immediately start working? You know, can we come up with this common format and have something that's open and accessible to everyone? Um, what that really means from our point of view is in GFF. So that's what we're focusing on for the next three days. Sorry, lots of people are showing up now. Um, and this is kind of a, a drawing that got recently produced uh, for a publication by Henning Falk. All these images are online and you can use it to explain next generation file formats to, to your users if you would like. But this, the simple explanation of what they are is they, they take the binary data they, and they open it up so that the, the, the metadata is readable. So the metadata is no longer encoded in the binary format. There's a well-defined layout, meaning that if you know what you're looking for in the image, you know how to write down the URL to load your data, as opposed to needing to search through a long binary list. And there, there are certain kind of knobs that you can turn when you're setting up your data, when you're writing your data to disk, like configurable chunk sizes or various compression or no compression at all, but that it ultimately leaves the data in a format that still has the same API which allows us to plug in many different viewers. And so this goes back to what discussed, got discussed at least during the morning of day one, which is, well, how are we going to plug in 3D viewers to Romero, et cetera, et cetera? Maybe the actual question is, how do we plug in a large number of viewers into NGFFs? And that's regardless of whether or not it's in IDR. So again, focusing on this kind of common layer that the language that we can use, the pipes that we can plug into to get our data to where we're going um, in a common way. And then we think everything else will start to fall into place. But we are really kind of focusing on the low level details for the next couple of days. Again, so today is really all about this kind of viewer ecosystem. And I'll turn it over to Jean-Marie and Will and Peter to tell you more about that. Um, day three is really getting into, well, how are we going to store metadata in this format? Um, and it's kind of a, a deep dive in a different direction. And then day four, I guess, will be all about the, specifically about the Java ecosystem, so bioformats and Fiji. What's, what are we going to do as a community to really get Czar um, supported there? So that was a very quick uh, hello and just kind of setting the stage. I hope there are no questions, but if there are some, we can do that while we're switching PowerPoints here. And for everyone who showed up a little bit late, one more time, welcome and enjoy.
see the chat, Josh, is there any question for you? Or... No. Hi, good morning. So yes, Josh indicated we're going to look at um, the viewer landscape, how many the viewer that are available that at least we know of, we probably miss some and um, and how we'll do some, oops, so just next slide. Yeah, we'll review, we did a, a review of the various viewer we know of and how they support the some aspect of the specification. So we'll, we'll go over that shortly. We'll do some demo and um, we'll discuss, depending on time, what is needed from the viewer perspective in terms of specification, how people, what they basically need. Um, we have also created some uh, breakout rooms. Um, if people have questions for a specific viewer after the demonstration, we can go into some breakout room if somebody wants to know more about Mobi, Napari, et cetera, we'll, uh, we'll go, we have uh, given the, that opportunity. So first of all, we have looked um, in, for our um, evaluation. We have converted some. We, there is we have converted some data from IDR. So that, those are data in uh, in a catalog we have created. Sorry. So those are public sample that we have converted, and you can see some key information. They they are publicly accessible. So already, if you are aware of some. Uh, some public sample will be very interested to start recording them. We have not put those link into a, a final location yet. So it's mainly in presentation. There's some also from the bioimage archive that have been converted. We're aiming to record all those information probably on the NGFF page specification page. So at least there is a, a bundle of knowledge there for when people are looking for sample when they're testing the application. So as I said, before going to the table, I just would like to point out this is early days. So for the people looking at the viewer, just be kind because not, not everything is supported in, in the spec. The spec is also in very early days and viewer, as we know, software is catching up with elements. So it takes, it takes time to develop feature and uh, we'll see there probably some bug along the way. This is the nature of development of software. As I say, this is work in progress, and as always, help is more than welcome. So what we did in preparation for this meeting, we looked at various viewers and uh, that we are aware of that um, can open uh, OME and GFF. Some, like uh, N5 viewer, will be coming soon from discussion with uh, John Bogovic. That support will come soon, so we didn't include into the table. As I said, if you are aware of other viewer that can open, please uh, let, let us know. We can evaluate or you can even evaluate it yourself. So the table is organized as, as follows. So on the feature column, those that correspond to feature that are currently in the spec, like axis, multi uh, label, et cetera. So that, that feature of the specification. And we looked uh, if they are supported in the various viewers. So the color code is fairly simple. Green, the feature is supported. Red, the image doesn't open at all. So we can't, we can't evaluate, obviously. Yellow, the feature, the file open, but the feature doesn't seem to be supported from our perspective. Obviously, we might we're not expert in in some of those tools. So it's just from our testing. And uh, gray. We couldn't confirm if it was uh, some file. Sometimes it looks like it is supposed. Sometimes it's not. But we couldn't confirm because some sample might have multiple feature mat that might have uh, an effect on each other. So when you look at uh, a given sample, you will see a uh, feature. So, sorry, you will see a little icon that indicate a bit more of what that axis VO3 means. So you can look around it. Those are the sample we have been using, and you will see a, a tick next to it. So um, this is how we, we use the validator. We have developed a tool called the OME NGFF validator. My colleague Will Moore will demonstrate that afterwards. And next to the for some some file, some uh, viewer are web based, like uh, Vizar, Neuroglancer. Um, VTK, there is a, a web nostos, you can have a, a link so we can open them. So if you see a little I in the column, that you can directly open the sample in the viewer and have a, a feel for, for that viewer itself. 
in some column you will see a little uh, GitHub action, GitHub uh, icon. That means the problem, the the feature is not supported, but it's recorded into the as a, as a GitHub issue or, or potentially there's a pull request already open, so people are aware that the feature might already be in the pipeline or the developer of the tool are aware of, of it. And uh, the, if you see the little eye icon, there's some potentially restriction of the why we couldn't confirm and there's explanation of what we saw and or what we didn't see. So as always, this is um, under Git, GitHub. So if you want to help us expand that table or even correct uh, correct the table, just go at the bottom of the, the improve this page. We'll put the link into the into the notes uh, afterwards so you can access this link. So that will just uh, give you, uh, if, if you want to correct what we have seen or if, if you're aware of the mistake we've made, I said, we are not uh, necessarily expert in, in those tools. So that's why I would like to do some, uh, to go to next section and, oops, sorry, what's going on here? I'm obviously not in the slide. And do the demo. So for the demonstration, we'll look. Uh, my colleague Will Moore is going to look at the validator, and so this is the order of the demo. For the VTK, we'll not do the demo to, uh, this morning because Matt McCormick, which is uh, leading the the effort of VTK uh, viewer, will be joining us uh, in the afternoon session. And unfortunately, we didn't have anybody to from a neuroglancer that could attend. So if you want to see how it looks in neuroglancer, you will see a, a little eye icon and feel free to, to click on, on this icon. So I will pass it to my colleague, uh, Will Moore, to start the demonstration of the validator. And before that, we noticed yesterday, we didn't have, we had a break quite, uh, not yesterday, but the, the day before, break quite late in the day. So we'll probably do a, a break around the hour mark to give people a chance to, to have a coffee or stretch their leg before the, the second part of the of the meeting. Unless we are fully done after an hour, which we might be also now. Okay, passing on to, to Will. Okay, thanks, um, Jean-Marie. So I'll just kick off um, from them where he left off on this, this page, um, just talking a little bit about this tool, um, OMI NGFF Validator. Um, and as he said, it's available from, for, to open all these images, is this with this uh, checkbox, a uh, check mark. Um, so this, this tool is hosted online, but you can um, specify a source URL um, um, in the, the, the URL here to load any publicly available sample. And if you have a sample on your local machine and serving it from localhost, you can open that as well. Um, so this tool essentially has two purposes. One is to um, validate um, data, hence the name, but the other is just to provide a sort of a useful inspector um, to be able to inspect um, the file to help for debugging and that sort of thing, and to understand what, what the file is like, looks like on disk. Um, so what it does uh, initially is, lo is load, uh, given the URL, it loads the this top level .z atras file, um, and that's the URL it's using to load. Um, and that's the what contains the, the metadata for an OMI NGFF file. And that's uh, browsable here. You can see the top level um, is a, a multi-scales um, object. This is pretty much what defines uh, an OMI NGFF. Um, and you'll notice that for some of these um, items in this hierarchy, there's a little information icon pops up when you mouse over. If you click on that, it opens the corresponding version of the spec um, at, at the corresponding section. So that gives you more information about that, that part of the spec. Um, uh, so the multiscales is the top level, it's got a version, and we're using that version to load the correct um, version of the schema. And again, the, the URL that's loading from is shown there. And then we're just validating, using that schema to validate this file um, in the browser. Um, and that's basically just checking um, that all the types are correct and that essential um, 
parameters, essential items are there to make the file valid. So in this top level, um, multi-scales, multi it's, it's a list. Um, typically, there's just one um, item in here, um, and although it's possible to have more. Um, and this contains some metadata, in this case, the axes for version 4 has this is a, this is a, a, a 4D um, file, X, Y, Z, and C, and the units for the axes are there. Um, and then the, the data sets. So this is a um, specifies the multi-scale pyramid, um, starting at the top level with the largest, um, the, the highest resolution um, pyramid um, or data, and it contains essentially a path to where to to that data, um, and and then some some additional metadata metadata in version four, which is, um, includes coordinate transforms transformations scale and we can have uh, translation here as well so these paths are used to go to the, the, the next level in the hierarchy and that's where the the czar data is stored so that's shown on on the right here um and again the the paths that it's loading this data from are shown so path zero and it's loading this z array um which gives us some details of the czar data um and you can see here the sizes of the, the um, array in the four dimensions um, and the sizes of the chunks. So also, also this little check at the top here checks that the number of, uh, the, the number of dimensions here matches the number of axes um, in the metadata. And it checks that all the, all the um, pixel array types are the same, that sort of thing. Um, so you can see the size of the array, the size of the, of, of the whole array on disk, and then the size of the individual chunks um, on disk, in this case, 125 cubed um, chunks. And there's a, some representation of the, how that looks. Um, and you can also see the actual um, ZAR uh, metadata itself that, that specifies all that, including things like the dimension separator. Um, there's a link here. Um, this will open this image in, in Vizar. We're planning to add um, other viewers here so you can open it in any of the online um, viewers that we've mentioned. Um, okay, just one other example I'll show, um, which is a plate layout here. Um, so this is specified at the top level. Z Atlas has a, a plate which contains all the, um, the plate metadata. And then nested below that is um, all the wells and images. Initially, in this right hand panel here, we're loading the first well for each location in the grid, as well as um, sorry, a well for each location, as well as the first image. But you, in this case, there's a bunch of images um, for each in each well. And if you want to, you can validate um, all of those. So that's validating all the, the images for all the wells. Um, and you can browse this hierarchy. If you click on a well um, and, an, and an image, you can browse that hierarchy. Okay, so that pretty much covers everything I want to talk about for the um, validator. Um, and I'll go on to the second part of the demo, which is just a, a, a brief look at um, Vizar, which is a, a web based viewer. Um, so as, it, as we said, there's links for this available here. And this does exactly the same thing as the validator that opens the, the um, image specified in the source. Um, and this is a multi-dimensional um, viewer with Z and T sliders up here. Um, and it'll handle the multi-resolution um, Viewing of the of the pyramid as you as you zoom in, loaded high resolution layers, and it's got the multi channels here. Um, the, these are rendered according to the the rendering settings in the um, in the NGFF in the Amero metadata. Um, and I can also show what that looks like for the high content screening. It supports a plate. Um, so again, this will load a load the thumbnail for every um, well in the plate. Um, you can actually 
uh, this is not um, a uh, th these thumbnails are actually coming from the raw data, they're not sort of pre generated thumbnails. So they are, you can, it just uses the lowest resolution for each um, image for doing that. And so you can browse through Z and T if, if these are multi dimensional images. And by clicking on a single um, well, we can see all the um, images within that well. And that seems to be. Bit slow. Okay, um, so there's multi multiple fields within a well, and then I can click again from each of those and go down to to a particular image. Okay, that's um, my demo is covered. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. We'll go on to the next ones. Okay, I think I will be next with the Napari viewer, right? Uh, yes, sir. So, any question for? So far, or we, we can take question later. Okay, so yeah, go ahead, jo Joel. Okay, um, so I'll be talking briefly about the Napari viewer and OMI and GFFs. Um, well, well, I neither developed the Napari OMI's R plugin nor Napari. I was just a heavy user of uh, HCS plates in it, and I've been asked to briefly demo this. Um, so the first thing I want to demo is um, similar to what Will showed, um, loading HTS plates. Um, and for this, we open Napari. And in my case here, I have a, um, a plate with some wells um, on a share that I'm remotely connected to. Um, now that Napari here has the OMSR, Napari OMSR plugin, I can just drag and drop in this OMSR file, and it will start loading things um, with a bit of messages on the left. Um, it can actually load uh, the overview of, of the whole plate. And when we zoom around in this, um, we will start to load higher resolution data whenever we zoom in. And while it is a slightly stuttery um, in some of the movements, at least in, uh, in this version, it is responsive enough to allow us to actually browse plates. And if we zoom into very high resolution, eventually it loads um, the very high resolution, depends a bit on, on speeds. Connecting via VPN to a share uh, isn't that uh, conductive to it, but eventually here, high resolution data can be loaded as well. Hopefully even in the demo time. <laughs> Come on. I'm pretty sure it will do it. Let's see. Let's give it some other location to try and load. So and this is a joy of live demo. Yes, the joy of live demo. I would have a video backup if in case but it doesn't it, work at all, but it gives you a bit of the feeling of we can zoom around in it, but actually sometimes it might not load quite as fast as we'd wish. And ta-da, we can see full resolution data. <laughs> and Joel, what did you say? Where is the data stored right now relative to where you are? Uh, so basically it's on a remote share that I've mounted on my computer. And I connect via VPN uh, to the university network where this share is hosted. And yeah, uh, it does load, okay. uh, but it's. I'm sure we could improve the connectivity here to improve the loading. <laughs> um, so that allows us to really just browse plates. And the cool thing is um, we can uh, see both big overviews of um, HCS plates, and we can see uh, really zoom in and get full resolution data. Um, there's a few limitations still to this, of course, speeds and just the general, like how responsive it is. So I thought as a second part, um, besides the, like, the cool things that already work in, in the release plugin, I'd show a bit of the interesting developments um, that are happening on the Napari side and also uh, by Will on uh, loading labels for, for plates. Um, so I have a bit of a dev version that is all non-released um, <laughs> branches and, and pull requests. 
but one of them is a new async prototype uh, by Andy Sweet, and the other one uh, are the label loading. And in this Napari version, I can drag and drop the same place file in. Uh, typically, it uh, takes slightly longer for initial load, but then it becomes much more responsive to browse um, when we zoom around in it. And we get very fast loading, plus we will get the actual labels also loaded. Uh, so we're getting the plate loaded, now plate with labels. Maybe we turn off labels for a moment, and now butters as move, we can zoom around in the interface without stutter. Again, while we zoom in, we request lower or higher, higher resolution data. Um, we can also now overlay labels and get an idea of how good is our segmentation for different places in the plate. Um, and when we zoom in, we do load higher resolution data, depending a bit on, I would say, speed of the internet connection and um, a few things like this. Uh, but we can really judge then our plates at quite a high resolution uh, interactively. Uh, and this plate now here is about 100 gigs of image data, so we would never actually load this amount of images <laughs> in the viewer at once. Uh, but in this way, we can really explore the different parts of a plate by just zooming around. That is it from my side of the demo. Are there any questions that came up? So, um, so the thing, the interesting, work, the asynchronous part. Do you, do you have a timeline when that will be uh, included? So or I can't difficult. really speak as like the the Pari Cordev team. I don't know what exactly their timeline is. I know it's it's one of the big projects for their zero point five release, which is. At some point early to mid next year, I would expect, but um, I'm not doing this development. I've just been testing and using it, so I don't know when it actually will be finished and released. Yeah, it's, it's certainly um, boost, especially when you have played like this. It's quite a quite a nice feature feature to have. And I think the one of the difference between what Will was showing was with Visual is you have the ability to zoom in and out of when you compare images is all of them it's quite a quite a nice uh, nice feature I think it's a different approach to browse to browse plate in, in a way which both have the advantages I guess so and yeah and, and one thing I should have indicated when we look at the table is is also to help people choose when you're looking at the feature you can compare when you're developing even your file, that's that's quite handy to have a list of of viewer to to see if if what you are doing is correct in terms of uh, either file writing or even file reading when you are creating your own viewer. So to, for comparison purposes, it's quite nice. Thanks, Joel. Uh, there are a few a lot of question in in the chat, so we're trying to catch up. Uh, uh, feel free to ask question uh, to Joel now if you want to. Sure. I'll also be around for breakout room questions afterwards if anyone wants to discuss something. Okay, if no uh, further question, passing on to Christian. Is if he's here? Uh, no, Tishi was supposed to be here, but it doesn't look like he's there in in the morning. So let's go back to my agenda. He might come up uh, later, so maybe, uh, well, Norman, um, well, I'll give you a few minutes. Norman, do you want to start WebNosis because uh, Christian is not there for the... Yeah, sure, happy to do that. One second. Okay, so brief overview of what, um, how, how WebNosis works with uh, Omizar. As of today, so um, I think I'll best just show you how the whole workflow works. So go to the RER page to get some example data. Um, currently, we only support uh, 4.4 uh, OMI and GFF, so that's something to note. And there are a couple of other limitations. For example, WebDocents doesn't have support for time series just yet. Um, that's coming next year. Um, and channels, uh, multi channels, will come next week. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. 
Okay, so uh, the general workflow is um, click add data set once you're logged in to your account. Um, click to add remote star data set, paste in the URL, and click add layer. Then it will go on and uh, basically do uh, try and figure out what exactly uh, it is that sits behind the URL you just gave it. Um, we're going to give it a, a, a name. Let's call it star demo for now. And uh, with that, we can import that and um, click on view data set. Now it will um, load that. Loading speeds obviously depend on, on the storage backend. And um, now we're, we're getting that. We can't really see anything. That's because the histogram is not set up properly, but there's an auto range button. So you can just click on that and then it will load up. And um, this is only one of the channels that this data set has. Um, as I mentioned, that's the limitation currently working on. And probably will be fixed next week. So I can even change the colors for, for each of the individual layers once they're loaded. Um, of course, can uh, zoom in and out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how you can import data. Now, WebNosis is uh, a tool that you can also create annotations with. Um, so for example, you can create um, and volume segmentations. And we have this new experimental feature where you can um, do like autofills um, on, on clearly defined shapes. So you can just um, basically put in a, a bounding box and it will fill it up. And then we have an interpolation feature that interpolates between multiple sections. As you can see here, I, I skipped a few sections in between. Let's just uh, fill them up. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just try and uh, do this cell fully here. Um, okay, I know you don't need to go back. So let's fill this one up again and go back to here and fill this up. Um, so that's what can be done. Then we have a 3D um, visualization of, of segmentations. So you can see what I just drew, drew um, gets, gets drawn right here. If I save again, um, I can, I can uh, uh, update this so it gets uh, updated basically it's it's, it's server-based uh, mesh rendering so you need to save first to to basically get an update for that um yeah and this is uh this this is kind of the uh, basic things that you can do in terms of uh, creating segmentations on top of that of course you can also load in segmentations from OE and JFF avenue if you happen to have those and uh, if you can work on this privately in in your team and uh, they will have access to you to the segmentations that you've created, you can collaborate on these. Um, and uh, another feature that we've built is to export um, the data through um, signed links. If you've ever worked with S3, then this concept may be familiar to you. So you can create these these czar links, and they they have like a, a randomized ID, and they have can have an expiration date. And uh, with that, you can then load uh, this data that you uh, have created. Uh, including any annotations that you have made uh, into into other tools. So um, let's just try that out. So um, here I open up a Neuroglancer, which maybe even is just a short demo of how Neuroglancer works with um, the czar. So I need to give it this czar um, colon uh, slash slash, and then you can put in the URL. I can't see anything yet. Again, that, oops, that's because of the um, histogram that we need to adjust. So now we get the, the color layer, and uh, if we want to add the labels, then um, we can do that like this. So make sure to set it to a segmentation layer. There we go. And um, now we should be able to uh, let's see where is this thing that I've just drawn. Uh. Ah, here it is. Um, and you can see that also the segmentation is showing up. So, and uh, whenever you do an update uh, in in Web Nozzles and save it, then um, you can also reload it here, and it will be will be propagated. And um, because it's an expiring link, um, it's also something that you can share with outsiders if you want to, and you or you can re revoke access at any time. So, it so, uh, makes makes even outside collaborations easier. Yeah. So that's uh, Web Nozzles and Omi and GFF in a nutshell.
Thanks. Any question, Norman? No, people are quiet this morning. So let's move down the, the list. I think we, uh, ITK will, we can, uh, Matt is not here this morning. So Peter, do you want to go and do, because there were a few questions about Omero, uh, what the Omero column means. So do you want to uh, yes, start absolutely. the presentation? Yes, thank you very much. So, Hello, uh, my name is Peter, and let's uh, explore the way Homero handles the uh, OME and GFF format at the moment. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, possibly something you know. This is an Omero web, uh, and I will import an image, an OME, ZAR, an OME and GFF image into Omero. So uh, and this is probably something uh, which is to be highlighted. It's a difference uh, from, uh, let's say, WebNOSOS and Neuroglancer and VZAR, which were demonstrated uh, uh, previously. Um, I mean, uh, even Napari can open a image from S3 bucket, but Omero at the moment cannot open an image from S3 bucket. It uh, uh, All you can do is uh, to download that image uh, somewhere, which I did, and uh, you can see um, that I have here. Boss, that I have here a couple of images downloaded um locally and i will now import them to omero uh, for that you can use the uh, command line interface of omero only the omero insight is not ready for that yet um so i have my command ready here it's basically an omero import as you might be uh, used for any images uh, you uh, imported into Omero already. This is a flag uh, which indicates that the scanning of the uh, bioformats should uh, happen in a bigger depth uh, because you probably know that um, OMEs are, the OME NGFF is, um, uh, has um, uh, many um, subfolders. And uh, also, I'm putting a, a, a name uh, so that we can find it easily uh, once imported into Omero. This is the name of the target data set in Omero. This is basically a container inside Omero. And this is the, the item to be imported. OK. Um, so I just hit Enter. And depending on how long it will work, of course, uh, yeah, so I have to log into Omero to do that. Okay, so this goes quite fast and you will see in a second that all those chunks are being imported into Omero. And there is a report um, that there were quite a few files uploaded, but uh, they uh, result only in one image. And uh, I will, go here this if you remember on my command the uh, data set name was ome-ngff and i have to refresh the omero web and i have here the uh, 4995228 omezar which i just imported i have it here in the thumbnails in the central pane and i will double click on it to open it in omero iViewer Basically, the um, the feature which is now being uh, mainly uh, deployed to do the heavy lifting is the ZAR reader. It's a new reader of bioformats. And uh, this reader um, enabled me to um, execute this import in the first place. Um, you, you can have uh, this reader in your Omero 
if you basically upgrade your Omero to the latest version. So this is, of course, the recommended way to get your hands on it. And um, uh, now I can uh, simply work with this image just as you normally would uh, with any other image which you imported previously to Omero, such as I can adjust rendering settings a bit like so and uh, make it nicer let's say get rid of the green background such as this um i will so this is um of course uh single z single t but uh the support is just like you know Mero you support we support five five d images uh multi channel multi z multi t and also large images which I will uh, show you in a second. The only thing you have to take care or be aware of is that uh, the metadata after import are uh, just set to default and uh, some uh, things like channel names and channel colors will not uh, will not be respected. Um, okay so let me open the large image which is also a, a OME NGFF which I imported previously I don't want to bore you with uh, too much command line and you can see you can work with that as you normally would um, it's uh, it's a pyramidal image of course and uh, let's go back to the Omero web client and so that you trust me I mean, you trust me about this one because you saw me importing it, but if I click on the right hand pane on this icon, which is basically uh, showing the paths uh, from which the image was imported and I click here on show more on the imported from section, you can see that uh, indeed um, uh, there are the paths of the of the single chunks and uh, thus you hopefully trust me that this is an OMI NGFF uh, format. Okay, um, I think, uh, yeah, one, one thing to mention uh, in the table, which is here, uh, demonstrated by my colleague Jean-Marie and Will Moore, uh, and there are the eye icons. There is no eye icon for Omero. Uh, this is because at the moment it's a little bit um, more laborious to get things to Omero. And uh, uh, but nevertheless, we plan to publicize a couple of the images, such as the ones I just demonstrated, uh, because Omero, of course, has a publication capability as well. Um, I thank you for your attention and I uh, would pass back to the chair. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So there's a question from Laurent about metadata. So the what what metadata are you talking about? Because here, the, not all metadata you will have in a property file. Is it what you're meaning? Because they are, this is only what's in the ZAR file. So long if you, because yeah, so, obviously, so I guess we can break that, break that down a bit. So there's, if you generate an, an OMI NGFF using um, bioformats, uh, bioformats to raw, it will take all the metadata that bioformats can read from from the original image, just as it does when you import it into Mero, and it will generate an OMI XML um, metadata file sort of companion file to the OME NGFF um and that's in a we, we haven't talked about it much actually but there's a that's there's a, a, a format called bioformats to raw that basically wraps the individual images within the series as along with that metadata and then if you import all of that it will have all the metadata that that bioformats has read from the original file and that will be imported into Mero. um what we the the amount of metadata out, other than that that's in in currently in ngff is really restricted to the a very limited number of sort of rendering settings and channel names um and that's not currently understood by bioformats um that's kind of transitional it's it, it's respected by a couple of the viewers we've seen um Vizar and um and napari but um 
yeah, the channel names and, and settings are not read by anything else, including bioformats. So you don't get the channel names and the, and the colors and things when you import it into a Mero. So I think that. That answer your question, Laura? Basically, it depends on the, the, the hand raised. I can't see who that is uh, on my screen. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, okay, go. Oh, yeah. yeah, Matt, yeah, I can see you now. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just sort of follow up to what Will was saying, because I was going to ask about the um, Amero settings, which do the rendering, which is why I think in Norman's demo, you needed to do the histogram adjustment. Adjustment. Will, Will just mentioned that that's sort of transitional. How's that transition? land and should the in the long run be rendering settings in the only engine method data there there is an issue with the proposal on that that we open That's in your last to, slide uh, i think yeah yeah but we we can bring it up now that the question is here doesn't doesn't really matter is uh, so that's uh, I just put it in the chat for everybody so that's issue number 78 where we're trying to capture obviously as will indicated the the omero option was very limited there was kind of early days of uh, of the specifications that was kind of convenience to pass but we have tried in that issue to capture at least of well this was done almost as a year ago of the viewer we were aware of that were we were looking at we we're looking at big data viewer because at the time mobi was um that that will demonstrate afterwards was supporting uh, elements so it would be good to have everybody that is uh, here that are working on on viewers on the perspective of what's needed and i know norman mentioned certain things earlier on they will be good to chime in on that and if we are on the right track or not because that's not been implemented that's kind of initial proposal and if we see that's an element that is needed for all viewer in order to move forward that will certainly in terms of acceptance from a user base that's something that could be prioritized i think with obviously that will need to be discussed with a larger group but i think we are here to discuss what is needed from a visualization perspective um, so um yeah if, if matt if that answer and if please on the 78 uh i don't think that Christian is here to, oh, uh, so I was going to do a, a demo of uh, Mobi of what Mobi offer um, and please um, I, I, I'm just a we've been using it for testing so I'm obviously by no means an expert of the feature so and what is and what is not but you will actually appreciate what we were uh, this discussing earlier on when we we're trying to evaluate some feature. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to start uh, sharing my, I would have to share my uh, desktop. Hopefully there's nothing controversial on my computer that you can. <laughs> so the, the Mobi, you need the, the plugin. So if I go back, you will need to install similar to Napari. There's a, a plugin to install. So if I go back to my uh, table, yes, we have a guide. So you, if you follow the instruction of that guide, it's just uh, turning on the Mobi website on and then install the the Mobi plugin into Fiji. So obviously you need Fiji installed. So when Fiji is installed, you will see under the big data viewer a new entry called OMIZAR. And, and there you have multiple options to open, for example, an image from S3, S3 credential, etc. So I'm going to first look at opening an image from OMIZAR from S3. And that, and then you have your checkbook. I've already opened a file that we're using for our testing uh, sheet. So that I'm here, I'm, I've opened v, V3 or access V3 that we wanted to validate. And it open it's just a second. So the open USB data viewer. And as you can see, initially there is something. So when we, when we did the review, that is the big white blob, as far as we can tell, is the, the label. So that's, we could argue the label could do. Are they fully supported or not? That, that we're not judging, but you can you can see that the difficulty that we 
you might encounter when you start to to over to see which feature are there or not so so it, so i turn off the the label i just put color and pick some color and that's i think that's why as well the, when you're developing a tool you so that's how the image look like and if i want to open it for example in another viewer that support we have uh, like visor is supporting it so if i click in a new window and that's allowed me to okay to validate that my viewer so people developing tool can easily find sample that and also validate um, very quickly that the label the axes are supported in mobi the, the label what um, what norman was showing about label earlier on then we could validate and improve every tool can improve each other they can improve and compare to each other to see if they are supported the, the feature so that's just how you open a file to um in in the big data uh, viewer for mobi mobi as also if you if you are looking at the the option there is export image current image to emizar so if let's uh, open so that means you need to open a standard image into image j not from the big data viewer so if i open i don't know uh, one of the sample file that it this is just for demonstration purposes so if i go sell this is a, a jpeg image so that's in the image plus of if you're familiar with uh, fiji or image j the image is is open in a component called image plus then you go to image uh, big data viewer czar or emizar export current image to emizar and so i decide okay image name and i click okay so I ignore the output from the console this is just kind of warning that something uh, this is from before when i uh, this has nothing to do but this is a warning pixel is not the unit of work but this is the most important thing it's done if i go now if i decide to open so i've exported this image into a, a czar file here you can see this is a structure that we we're looking earlier that will was showing earlier on about the the file itself so i deliberately picked a, a, a small file because it's obviously a demo and if i go big data viewer open czar and in that case i will say open czar from the file system select the folder that i've just um, created and that's open you see the mobi open in the big data viewer so the big data viewer as now where well, that's initial image was open in the image plus this is the big data viewer the big data viewer where you open the, where, where the omizar file are open so and if you want to bring the rendering control you select the letter p and then you can and, and then you can you can open it like any omizar files again that could be a if you Unfortunately, I don't know which, I didn't check which version of OMIZAR. I, I could do that late, later, but I, I didn't, I was expecting Christian to be here. So it's just to show the feature, but it will, it will uh, create a, a file. So that's again, another viewer. It's in the, it will fall into the, I think the, the category similar to Napari. You will need to that, have in, that installed on your desktop compared to some of the other one we have looked at that are more web, uh, web based. So this is a, a different environment. And as you know, we, uh, Fiji is Java, Napari is Python. So you have different, different type of languages and different area of support. I think that's the only thing I wanted to show for the Jim, there was a question from Oops. Julian. Can you select Sorry. the pyramid levels in the export? So how many pyramids, which sizes, et cetera? In the export? Okay. I will let's look at it because I don't know. <laughs> we'll discover together, yeah. Yes. As, uh Rao's name. No, use default export parameters. So I don't know. Down sampling. Make sure. 
Easy property in the image. So, okay, so I don't think you can at the export level. Uh, so I think on the main image, you may have to decide of some option, but I, by the look of it, no. We'll have to investigate that. And uh, maybe Christian might join us later this afternoon and we can ask him the, the, that question. So sorry for not being more helpful on that one. Is there one, uh, uh, is there one out here? Seek the pyramids and exports. So many pyramid by size. So actually, no. Other. So maybe if we want to. Uh, okay, there's another question. Does a movie export use buffer to convert? Does it write metadata? The movie export from where? Uh, I'm okay. I'm I'm sorry, when... I tried to write Moby, not movie. Ah. The OMIs are export that you were just showing. Uh, uh, we'll have to, as I said, I'm not the developer of the tool, so we'll have to dive into the code itself. Uh, we can, if we have a break, I'm happy to have a quick look at glance at that and see if we can find uh, more information for, for you. Because let's say the main developer of the tool is not, uh, we're hoping it will be here, but it is not. So I'm, I'm happy to, to quickly check. So if we want to have a five minute break and start, and come back for some more discussion or if people want to continue this discussing various thing of what is needed from a viewer perspective or export perspective we are happy to stay up as, as you wish or if you want a five minute break for a, a quick coffee quick coffee and five minutes and we can come back to some discussion okay thanks all for the so demo five past the hour gm yeah, yeah, just five, around five, if you people in the snow no rush. So I think from from the chat, there's probably two two element to maybe to raise and we can, we can see if we can. There's a conversion aspect that we started to e export in certain element to people start to write uh, OME in, in GFF. So there is, um, uh, Josh, I hope you don't mind if I put the link from the GBI 2022 workshop that you have put a no nice notebook, which was actually from, I put a link here for people interested. So there is, that's, that's more the command line tool to generate, which explain how to find the data. Um, at her, um, and um, which have a kind of a nice workshop that was created uh, a while a while ago just to describe so obviously things have all but just to describe how to get your data and change your your data from into into the ZAR format chris uh alan which is from uh, as you know from glencore indicated the tool um so we didn't plan to demo demonstrate it uh, any of those tool today if if we if you guys think that is something you want to see we may want to Get get some uh, try to demonstrate like later in the evening session if if we're ready for it. But it's a it's obviously a, a need from the community. But I think uh, Chris put the link there to the tool, and uh, that um, I think you will be up, uh, maybe organizing. You can use the tool and download it and and try it uh, you, um, yourself and that's that's also that's not command line oriented uh, obviously that's maybe there's two approach for people that are uh, will, wishing willing to no, wanting sorry i'm trying to find my word here uh, to convert the, the, the original file into uh, into uh, OME and GFF. So if some people want to see that more in action uh, or follow this workshop, but follow those instructions, that's what I would recommend. The next point, I think, uh, I don't know if we want to, Josh, you responded on various thing about the S3 and um, 
confused and goofy, etc. Is it something we want to to raise? Because that was then Peter was in, indicating the Omero um, importing the data into Omero. That's kind of different from what we have seen for some of the of the viewer and what we are trying to achieve from a, an IDR perspective. Um, sure. Just so very briefly from my side. Um... I mentioned it earlier. So at EBI for the IDR, we do have S3 storage. Again, thanks to Matt and team. Um, we found out, well, actually I should pass over to Seb because he's the one who's done all this work. And so you know, that's our driver. And so that's how we've, uh, we have been working with S3, but um, doing it via these kind of FS-like systems that Seb's been testing. It should be me. Uh, yeah, so shortly, so that concerns Omero and NGFF. So if you take Omero Server 565, uh, the expectation that Omero talks to file system isn't changed. So, that, so that's the, the short version of everything, right? So you, as long as you can emulate whatever you want as a file system, you should be fine. Uh, effectively, there's a series of tools I think the two main ones, uh, so Goo, Fees, and S3FS have been mentioned there. There's actually some comparison between the two of them, but more or less you mount S3 buckets locally as if it was like you know NFS or something else, and you allow it to view it as a file system. We have some in-progress testing of all of that in IDEA. None of that is production yet, but we're trying to move towards production. Um, as always with these, all these tools, uh, latency becomes much much bigger concern than it is for even than, you know, NFS already had similar issues, but this is something that you'll see more and more. So uh, how quickly you can retrieve your data, you add another layer, uh, there's additional layers of complexity uh, added to your stack, which can actually put, if you don't consider them carefully, you can put your Omer server in, in a bad situation. So it's an in-progress in progress work. We're trying to explore that. We're trying to gather information about how to use that. So with the current infrastructure, that's a solution potentially for uh, importing NGFF into Omer 565 uh, from some S3-like system. Um, but again, the real solution long-term will be hopefully to talk directly uh, to S3. So without having these kind of fuse layer. Anything you want to add, Matt, on the that or even the strategy for some of the S3 file you have? Uh, I guess it, it, very similar to what Seb says. I think at the moment, these things are compatibility layers because we need to live in a world of mixed file system and s3 but in the long run the idea is they shouldn't be necessary um i did just want to say briefly before the discussion gets more into the technical details huge huge thanks for putting together the table in that i kind of came to this session with one request which is that could we have a table that lists all of the viewers and the features and looks at compatibility and you have done a fantastic job of doing that so that is amazing thank you Yeah, thanks. And obviously, that's uh, not uh, as as we said. It's it's work in progress, and I think Norman has been active on making nice suggestion of uh, of how we could improve as a as a I think as a community we need to to make uh, to make that um, one thing we we discuss and. I think it would be good to have your perspective because we started to have multiple tools. We have the various catalog, as we pointed out, uh, Bioform, uh, Bioimage Archive, sorry, has already some public data. We have some public data um, where we want to put that, uh, that resources. So one candidate, and obviously we can, um, was to get the NGF, to go to the NGFF, um, to use probably that after the format might change, but at least using that URL as a center, we might reformat how things are laid out, uh, but will that help? Um, what what we want to, just to see is, will that help already people looking for sample, looking for tool 
and uh, having having all this URL uh, in in one location because so far it's in presentation, it's in <laughs> word to mouse, you, you and it's very difficult. But I think that that URL has been the central the reference point. So we might change how it, how it works. Could maybe go to read the docs or something like this. We, we that's that's more technical discussion later on because we cannot have one big page. But will that help already people developing tools to find sample? Because um, like uh, Norman suggested, certain order from the catalog, if if people know of other sample, we can start registration, registering them. And uh, so that's more opening for people developing tools. What do you actually need in order to, to develop those tools? Or even the user, like uh, Joel was indicating, is a tester of Napari, but sometimes you want to test with other file. What will be necessary from from your perspective? So I can report from our experience. Um, before the table was available, um, and I think this is really a great tool because it um, it it lists now the data sets in the gallery with the various features, but it also tells you which viewers actually show it right because previously we were just trying different viewers and we're trying to figure out what is actually the, the right visualization. Um, and I mean, we, we had some guesses, uh, but enough always was right. And now it's really good to basically have a vetted list of, of, of ground truth um, in there yeah so so that's really helpful i think the validator is just super helpful um for for exploring what the what the data actually um is and, and looks like so I, I think these two resources will be super helpful for for any new implementations um yeah and i think for other other things i mean we'll um if you want to create a new tool now I think it's becoming easier because there are uh, czar libraries coming up for for uh, multiple programming languages, so you don't have to implement that on your own, and that already gives you a big head start into uh, implementing OMI and GFF. So that's um, of course that needs some more work, and I know we're going to talk about Java in the coming days, um, but it's uh, I think that's it's, it's becoming much much better. Uh, plus one from my side on how useful the validator is, especially to check if you write custom files and it's like, well, do they follow the spec? We think we do. Let's actually check it. And now we have a nice thing we can integrate in automated testing. So it's really useful to have a good way to be sure that we follow the spec as defined. Yeah, and those um, uh, schema files can be, can be used for validating um, using other languages as well. So that's a JavaScript implementation, but you can use Python or assume other languages. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Uh, so thanks for those comments. Maybe a response to what Norman just said. Norman, referring to what you're seeing there as ground truth, that's actually, um, we appreciate that, but very generous. As noted, this is, you know, as I think Jean-Marie said it um, multiple times, work in progress and attempt, you know, on our side to sort of, collate this information, but obviously it's something we want to take forward. Maybe a question to Josh, where you, from the czar community standpoint on the one hand, and then maybe a question to the rest of you from the imaging scientist community, where should we, you know, sh should we advertise some, you quote, advertise or post some of this on image SC and try to get more feedback, try to get more take up? Any other? So I mean, I'm I'm trying to meet the ground truth uh, um, moniker that you've used, Norman, which is appreciated. But you know, we have ways to go there. To some extent, so I'm not exactly sure what you're scratching at on the czar side, but I think the same problem exists there in the sense that. Um, you know, largely czar Python is seen as the standard implementation or the reference implementation. And so what it does with a czar is considered truth. And now as the, as the ecosystem grows, that's probably not true anymore, you know? And so I think they have the same problem. They're working on it as well. Um, I don't think there's a lot you can do other than have a really great, uh, set of tests 
I mean, that's what OME has done for decades now with bioformats. So for anyone who doesn't know, you know, there are terabytes of data that sit behind bioformats that get checked on every PR. Um, I think we have to do that same hard work for NGFF, but also for Czar itself and just build up the, what is it, our trust really in all the different layers. So from bottom to top. And so certainly help completely welcome on that. So this goes back to issue, uh, Joel, you commented on it. Which issue is it? The one I sent earlier about sample data. If you have data that you think is you know, valid, by all means, share it with us. Give us screenshots of what you think it should look at, possibly in multiple tools. And we'll just get all that into a single place. Or maybe it doesn't have to be a single place in this new federated world, but it uh, I guess it needs to be findable from a single place, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. I think that that's that's where we're going to get because Sean indicated there he had some data mounts on the on the mount and whatever we can share it's the best because as you, you might have seen when Will was putting a, his validator he had a x number of the fixes etc because we noticed some some issue with some of the file even we generate so because they were misconfigured at some stage so a thing is trying to get those the sample the correct sample or deemed correct. Uh, available for people um, and uh, um, yeah making giving them and also by version because as we've seen some uh, some we didn't mention we didn't show the IT, um, itk viewer but some some version will will open some will not uh, or will open in a, in a very strange manner so at the moment for example vtk support v4 if you look at, at v3 v03 things start, start shifting so the, the image move slowly because some multi like scaling are not correctly supported so that's important to to add so so yeah if you have a, if you have sample uh, same for anybody developing any tool please let us know where they are and we are we'll be happy to to register zeus link as again on public uh, on the GitHub repository, everybody can can open uh, can open PR. Yes, you have a hand raised as well. Yeah, on the love or on the question of sharing sample data, um, is there a preferred way of like how it is stored online somewhere? We now started using Zenodo more for this. I've heard in the conversation a bit of like, oh, there might be like some issues of just directly loading then from Zenodo. Is Zenodo a good place to share this uh, for the Orange FF community, or is there? Oh no, there's a better public repository we can easily put it on? So Wei and I and a few other people had reviewed, so this is about six to 12 months old now, a, a large number of repositories. So that includes Dryad, Zenodo, Figshare, you know, go through all of them. And nothing, none of the public data repositories just worked out of the box. So. I don't think that means we shouldn't use them. And so I think if you have you know, a collection in Zenodo and you have all of those IDs, I think we need to be able to work with that. Um, there are several issues that are outstanding. We need to decide, are we gen then just always zipping the data? And therefore we, we need a zip driver to load on these Rs. Um, <laughs> probably what we need is actually a table of which public repositories support remote access to the OMEs are as well. Um, uh, Chris, I'll let you do that verbally. Um, and then we will grow the number that we can support. And I think do what do what's useful to you today. So don't make more work for ourselves, you know, collect things, share things that you have, and then we will build up knowledge of what's actually possible. Chris, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was just going to start putting all these things on these public resources, and they're relatively large, and then lots of people use them. <laughs> uh, we get these uh, resources pretty unhappy with us pretty quickly. So I, I was just curious if anybody's looked at what Zenodo and others are saying as far as their acceptable use policies and all of that kind of stuff. I, I don't, I've not personally looked at any of that, but... I would assume they have them. But, I mean, another limit of Zenodo and having tried to at least make an archive of the public NGFF sample and idea of there is the limit. 
the size limit. I mean, some of the data we'll generate will exceed the typically what, like 50 gigs limit above which you really can't upload by yourself and you have to contact them. For some of these real world samples and and you will, I mean, it's not going to be as easy as upload my zip uh, either way. Um, I mean, we've used it for a couple of data set mostly because that provides us a kind of source of archive, right? In case of a in case the copy in the S3 storage of EBI disappears, we have it there and we can recover it from there. As Josh said, our attempts to talk directly to Zenodo haven't been great. And, I, and as Chris said, I'm not even sure I would use that directly. So we might need to look for a secondary place, but it might be like for many of these problems, these samples might need to be copied in different places anyway to have redundancy. Uh -huh. But in terms of the, uh, um, I saw Norman, you put some element in terms of developing viewer because we have obviously some sample that we have used. Uh, you uh, from seen one in passing. The order you indicating some of the order. What also what are people because we can there there is you going back to this ground truth element. We have file. We use a lot of file from IDR, so we know how they should look like already. We know how, how the metadata should look like because we have already um, curated uh, some file. What what type of sample do you need in order to move forward in terms of uh, the viewer development? Is there some one with like we were showing some with label today? what is needed in order to move forward from your perspective? Because we could generate all the data and like say in IDR or the bioimage archive and they will more or less look all the same. You know, it, it, that's not going to help the development of the, it's going to increase the volume and wherever that is, S3, Zenodo, whatever, but will that help? Probably not. So what what is needed from people developing viewer perspective? So Norman, if you had already something in mind, and I've seen some yeah, in passing, I'm, so I'm, 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 I, I'm not, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't uh, know, because I saw in some issue in passing, I didn't have time to, to read them thoroughly, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wrote up what I thought in an issue already. I think, I mean, what, in general, um, as, as a diverse set of uh, examples, if you can conceive would be appreciated, because that's, that's what we can, basically, and we can test every single edge case. Um, I think the collection you have is already pretty strong in terms of the features of OMI and JFF. Um, I just added one, one more thing. I think these storage backends is another thing because uh, not everybody wants to use S3 um, and not every tool supports every single storage backends. Of course, it's a bit hard to draw the line there. What, what do you want to include and whatnot? But um, I, I, I made up a short list of what, what I think um, are the, the main backends that people want to use. Um, I, another edge case I was just thinking about is uh, large data sets. Um, like a very large that, that you can't really download in full or, um, or or I don't know, maybe they just even overflow some some integers or something in, in a dimension or something like that. I don't know. But that, that would be also something um, useful to, to add to the list. Um, and then just probably different modalities. Um, we, we're happy to supply some examples from EM data. Um, uh, but I know, I mean, there are t tons of different modalities that the people acquire, and they so some of them have quite different metadata and uh, viewing settings and stuff like that. Uh, but basically, the stuff we already talked about today. Catching up with a. With, uh the the chat so okay so what we currently have is is fine for what is from if i get that is more some edge case potential edge, edge case that uh, will be will be needed um in order to to get to sample and you said you you'd be happy to provide some em em sample uh, do you have some already uh publicly available that we could have or you will generate because us for example in the case of um 
for the table, we create a public account for web Nostos. So I, I don't know if that is something in order to have the link uh, in the table. Is it something you want to have a general account that we could put them there as a rule of thumb or? Yeah, so um, I mean, on webnos.org, we have a collection of public data sets and uh, every data set in webnosos has, uh, will be exported in, in OMI NGFF. Um, so um, I can supply some URLs and they can be used. The only thing is that we use dot dimension separator and not slash. So that's the only incompatibility at this point. Uh, Chris, no, no, you, you, were you raising your finger? my finger at Norman for using the dot separator rather than the slash. That's ah, <laughs> what um, did to say something. Go, for, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that uh, is anybody here really into other cloud providers um, really interested in storing stuff in Azure or Google Cloud or... Wait, I I'm a Google Cloud fan because it has HTTP2, which anecdotally I've heard is faster for this sort of fast, uh, this sort of like a you know, parallelized uh, fetching stuff that uh, happens a lot with like Zar and stuff. Um, uh, but I've, in practice, I found that it and S3 have similar performance. Um, so yeah, um, but I, I, yeah, I, I am, I, uh, in theory, I like the concept of HTTP2, but in practice, I've found little difference with it and uh and Amazon S3 and I don't think it's a fair comparison to compare like it against uh you know something like a like a file server because Google Cloud is obviously you know much stronger than a you're just like off the shelf file server and as I recall I don't think we ever actually got around to benchmarking like two like just basic file servers one with HTTP two and one with HTTP but if maybe we did, I'd have to go back and look. So that's that's my uh, that's my take on that. I was putting up an nginx with HTTP and HTTP two Elon, and how but with the same data wouldn't be worst thing to do. I think we did it at one point. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look. I don't remember. It might be in our paper. Um, I definitely wrote the like Terraform configs and set it up, but I don't remember what the results were. If we ended up using it for a variety of reasons. Um, oh, I do remember one thing. There is a bug in Google Chrome with HTTP2 and like caching or something. Uh, so yeah, I was a little, I think that's sort of what derailed things a bit. But And I also don't think they ever fixed the bug for what it's worth. <laughs> and you guys, when you say Google Cloud as well, Elon, you're talking about just pure HTTP, right? Not using the actual uh, GC whatever protocol, right? Right, just using it as a file store. So the same way you use it, yes. Yeah. Allah, you would not be able to, for example, make authenticated requests. I never have tried. Yeah. But are you talking like a pre-signed thing where the... Where no, are actual heard? authenticated requests to the... API. Ah, no, 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 I don't think so. I've never tried it at least, so... So I know that uh, I mean we, we don't use Google Cloud Storage by ourselves, but we do get the request quite frequently to add that um, as, a, as a source. I know that in the US, many uh, universities and labs get cheap or free credits from Google to host their stuff. So they um, use it quite frequently and, and not only in public buckets, but also in private ones. Yeah, and then for us, the other big um, storage backend is HTTP itself, which um, also has some authentication mechanisms um, that, that would be nice to, to have implemented. No Azure fans here. I probably don't have enough people from the UK. Okay, so summary is we need to expand that table to show different type of potentially data in a different cloud provider or different resource could be Zenodo, could be different point to show what where the data are. And there were discussion in the chat, try to summarize. So Julian will happy to provide some example for edge case. I think there's plus one and Jason was uh, suggest an empire for some EM data that would benefit. So, and uh, Matthew, because that, and that because Matthew will be probably 
have the headache of hosting some of those data somewhere. So, so, so if Matthew says thumbs up, that's, that's okay. You want to expand on that, Matthew? Or what do, what do you think in terms of, of storage? Yeah, go ahead, Matthew, and then Julie. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in a sense, in the long term, our plan is to look at ways to um, host more and more of our data and incoming data as NGFS in S3 compatible storage. What we're going to have to spend a lot of time doing in the meantime is developing tools that pull data out of our long-term archival storage systems, convert it and stick it into S3, which is actually not dissimilar from the problem of trying to take something that's in Zenodo and make it immediately accessible. So there might be interesting opportunities there, but we'd have to do that even for most of the existing data in Empire, for example, because very little of it is currently in NGFF native format, well, in NGFF, and when I say in native format. Um, I was going to say just briefly, uh, actually, no, I'll, 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 Julian was ahead of me in terms of other things, so I'll pause for a moment and come back on a different thing. Julian, this hands uh, raised, and I saw you want to expand on Matthew. Yeah, just so uh, because it was brought up now by me that we are often in the situation where we have a lot more channels than we have pixels in our data. And so I'm new to OMI NGFF, uh, but from what I understand is that the channels are always on a higher level than the pixel values. And if I understand ZAR correctly, we are doing compression on the lowest level of the data, right? So the chunks are compressed. Is there a way to reorder that? Because we usually have like, if we have more channels than we have pixels, I suspect that compression on the channel layer would give more space savings than on the pixel uh, layer. So the current specification has a strict ordering of the dimensions where X and Y have to be at the low end. That is in the process of being reevaluated with 0.5. So with the, the transformation uh, work, from John Bogovic, it should be possible to, to rearrange. So having you test that would be wonderful. Uh, I don't know if his work is to the state that he's ready for testers or not, but uh, I think we will remember and reach out to you to make sure it all works for you. Even sure. for cases where the channel count is not great, XYC, which is not a currently an option, is essential for, for example, compressing bright field data, et cetera, right? If we don't, yeah, if we don't have that option, it's it's really, really difficult. John should probably join us this afternoon. So we might be able to expand on, on that. Uh, where, where, I mean, the status of the work, uh, that's what I mean. And when it's going to be released. Uh, Matt, Matthew, you have another, you have Andres? Yeah, yeah, sort of slight, slightly different thought. Um, at some point, it might be useful to think about separating out the different use cases of the table. And, and this is on my mind because if we have more and more cases where we're presenting a, a, a data set, a study where most of the data is only NGFF, we want something where we can link people to pos link to possible viewers, really aimed more at people who are exploring the data and want something simple where they can download things and, and have links to instructions. Um, the table is probably a bit confusing for that use case. And we've been talking about it from the developer's perspective, but from the sort of user-friendly get started with our OE NGFF, here's a data set side, it, it might want a different focus more towards the, the trouble is that potentially gets into here with the sort of blessed viewers because they have the, the features. And at the moment, everything is very much not in that direction. Um, but that I can see as something we'll have to do at some point is, is guide people towards particular viewers that we think of sort of ready. Yes, so I think it's in 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 the spirit of what we're trying to do is as pushing again that table to see what when what is what and and again, I will encourage people developing viewer because we will we are, uh, 
if they know of a feature that is ready in the X version and Jason put it, we discussed that in the chat, versioning is something we need to, to address. We didn't, we just put some version of the software. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to find, but also the version of the table is, is essential. So we'll have to also think of how we are going to lay that out because what's true today in that table might be obsolete. So you want to make sure that the, the, the testing uh, or the evaluation matrix is is correct because you want a correct version of which tool at which plugin etc so that's something we need to to think seriously about to guide to guide the user as you indicate matthew for for that and that will i think that will help uh, everybody as a as a whole any more question point because I think in and in terms of specification uh, from a specification point of view because we touched the storage is there any urgent need from the people developing uh, viewer themselves or or user like Joel you use the Napari is this something that is critically missing from a user perspective and okay metadata we could get more and more metadata but that that's as uh, that was indicated by Will earlier on there's kind of a work around at the moment not work, work around is maybe not the term a uh, solution using the OME XML option um, because it's not all supported but what is probably missing from a specs perspective um, from a critical acceptance of certain viewer because for in many cases that we have found when you open you open the image and it's usually quite black uh, you open it because you know that you go to full pixel range and then the, the feeling the initial feeling when you start a viewer might not be um, might not be the best so is is focusing on having rendering setting a critical piece for people using the viewer that's that's for people using joel maybe you can want to answer I mean, that there is metadata in the um omero part of the omhffs that napari and the napari omsr plugins use to do the rescaling which is why I wasn't playing with those settings in the demo. Might, might be more a question of, is this something that more viewers want to use? Or is there something that is like, no, this isn't the place where viewers could use this. From the Napari side, I can say like, oh no, as long as we put the metadata there, it works very nicely. And on the things where I see like, oh yeah, those would be needed are mostly ongoing discussions that for example, Will has brought up on how do we load plates very fast? And do we have metadata on the plate level? I think are ongoing discussions that are really important to be had. Um, I'd say we should continue with those. Okay, so yeah, the because the the link I put earlier on about rendering settings is kind of an extension of the of this Omero settings. So the, I think we are probably on the right track with that and continue with that instead of adding more fuel to the to the fire. Uh, yes, Norman. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, from our perspective, like this Omero field, we don't really know what to do with it. Is it something that will stay or not? Um, is it worth our time basically implementing that now? So we haven't really made up our mind yet. If there's a new um, version coming up for this rendering um, kind of metadata, that, that's certainly something we'd be interested in. Um, I haven't looked too much into the proposal, but that would also be interesting for uh, segmentations uh, that are on top of that. like. Uh, important piece of metadata we we typically store is like the just the the, the maximum uh, segment ID that's available um, or something like that because then we can do plus one and create a new segment um, that's quite important for for our annotation purposes um, and yeah and and I mean I mean there are many other features that I would like to see in OMI and JFF but I uh, uh, that's that goes beyond the the rendering um, settings part yeah. Uh, I think the, to answer your first question, uh, I would think it's probably be better, more suitable to to push towards this, the rendering specification because I said Omero was a very small subset or like a tiny subset of that. So it would probably make more sense to see what, what's missing in that proposal and what is need to be added so we can uh, push forward with that and that uh, in the, in when this is agreed, we could look into 
moving that in instead of and replacing slowly the Omero feature because Omero is it was limited was necessary for the just few to, again to have the feeling of not this black image and I will certainly something that I will see better usage of your time so, so yeah if you have things missing just go for it so two things I've recently heard about in kind of the rendering space um but I guess we have to decide where to draw the line because to get the rendering issue as it currently stands out the door so that we can deprecate the Omero block, we want to keep it small, but of course there are lots of use cases which will make it larger. So that's a constant tension when writing any specification. Uh, and it probably speaks to our needing to make them extensible to some form. Uh, the one, the first was from, uh, I can't remember if Elon or Trevor were at the meeting um, there are kind of ongoing meetings of the various visualization tools that are at Harvard Medical School. Um, those are interesting and kind of that's where Viv is coming from. Um, there are also quite a lot of DICOM users in that space. And I was privileged to sit and listen to why the OME model is not sufficient and, and all of us should move to DICOM. Um, that's something that comes up frequently and you know there, there is a lot in DICOM that I think we need to evaluate obviously there's a we have to draw the line somewhere so there are things like color profiles do we bring those over you know to what extent do we try to bring the two formats um in some form of compatibility is is something we should think about um the other is from actually the Napari meeting yesterday so they're getting into what is it multi multi viewer Someone help me from the Napari side. So Multi-canvas. Multi-canvas uh, viewers, exactly, thank you. Um, and then you have multiple cameras, right? So each canvas can have a different camera. So you're getting into more of like the GUI state um, and can you persist that to disk and then reload it the next time you, you open the image? Um, that sounds interesting. It probably is a whole lot of work, so. We have to be very clear about where we want to draw these lines. And it might be that we try to do something that's compatible to the, you know, we do what we can and and everyone else can store their additional information in some format or specification of their own choosing that's somehow attached to the NGFF rather than our trying to do everything, right? So just some foods for thought. Thanks. Uh, there's some ongoing back and forth in the, in the chat. I don't know if people want to raise anything that that would be obviously recorded the chat, but yeah, it's just it's just for everyone's context. Josh, that was it's the imaging data commons guys that you were talking to ultimately. Is that correct? Well, yeah. So they're saying, um, yeah, the 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 color model in a DICOM viewer like OHIF is more powerful. So right. Yeah. So so I guess. Yeah, that this was the this is the kind of motivation that people are talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just going to reinforce what I said in the chat, which is that you know I think we all know that the OME model is is not currently set up to particularly well handle uh, full color data. I mean, it's just not set up there to do that. Um, and for those who care a lot about that, certainly the DICOM and the whole side imaging folks care a lot about that stuff. Um, yeah, they they definitely feel pretty un, I guess, not ignored, but just underrepresented, I guess, uh, with the way that the model is currently structured. I mean, I mean that, that's, yeah, I mean, and that's true for the compression schemes and all sorts of other stuff too, right? I mean. I think probably everyone we've seen this, you know, talk about data so far is would never compress their data lossy, <laughs> would certainly be happy to rechunk and do all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, that whole whole slide imaging community compresses all their data lossily, <laughs> lossily, um, often with some pretty aggressive and computationally expensive algorithms, uh, both from a compression and decompression point of view. Um, so yeah, it's a whole different set of, of issues for sure. Um, just ask the DICOM guys about compression algorithms and, you know, you'll get a list of about 40 or something, I think that are, um, available to be annotated in their spec. So yeah, it's, 
it's a big job to properly um, handle uh, that community. Uh, yes, Matt, you have hands raised? Yeah, I would also add, I think, that the sort of histology and whole slide imaging side worries me slightly because of all the issues I'm gradually learning about that, that Chris mentioned. Um, I had a kind of slightly open-ended question maybe for Josh and others in, in the how do you think compatibility with the table spec should be represented when it comes up? Because that's incredibly open-ended. You can sort of put lots and lots of different potential data in that and people are going to use it for things like point annotations for fish data and so on. But it feels like it might be hard to compress that down to a set of features that viewers might be aiming to support. Yeah, I imagine there's some form of um, spectrum here that we should probably talk about. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it the, the lowest level is probably um, if you had a completely image viewer, and then it's to tell the user, oh, there's this attachment, let them download it, right? I mean, and that download probably is simplified if you convert it to CSV or something. You know, it's so that. You know, if, I, I guess if I think in the pre-NGFF world, you would have some TIFFs in a in a in a zip, and also in that zip you would have some CSV files, right? And so we're trying to elevate that. Um, I I actually haven't seen a demonstration of what they're doing with the spatial data project in Napari, so exactly what that linkage looks like. But I think the how no, Mo, Mobi has things set up is a pretty good middle of the road. Um, strategy and, and it's basically the idea that in each of these two data structures there are identities there are objects that, that are that are being linked by this association so um you know if the segmentation then then each of the segments or each of the mask areas is an object id and then in the table you have a row of information that you're attaching so in Mobi, when you click on one the other highlights i think that's the the kind of minimal visualization interaction that someone would expect, or that's enough bang for the buck, so to speak, that it, it it's worth it. Um, I don't know if if anyone here can kind of speak to what's the higher end of the spectrum. You know, if, you know, Norman with WebNosis, do you have a feeling like, do we need to go even further where it come, when it comes to integrating tabular data? Maybe something like indices or summaries, you know, so then the viewer is actually pre-processing the table and, and storing or showing something that doesn't actually exist in the file format itself, right? Maybe while well, Norman uh, is thinking and one, one point on, um, I think a bit of the question of what do we do with the tables? It's also a bit separating. I don't think the Omero reader needs to do everything with the tables but it needs to hopefully find ways to say, this is how we can make tables accessible. Because for example, in Napari, we're looking to build plugins that allow users to do interactive classification of objects based on measurements in tables. Um, but that is very much a separate plugin. And the question is a bit, how do we get access to the corresponding table data from image data and less, oh, let's have a reader do plotting or do classification or do, uh, visualization of measurements on images. And then I think there will probably be a big diversity in different viewers on the different processing and visualization things that can be done with sets of tables and features. Yeah, I, I think the problem with tables is that they're um, can be underspecified. Like, well, what do we do with a generic table that, that somebody attaches to a data set? Um, what, what is the point? How do we render that? I think there is some need for some metadata to, to just define that. I, I have, haven't seen that yet. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, we have a couple of um, tabular data that we kind of maintain for data sets, and it would be nice to export that as, as NGFF, and uh, we can obviously do that without um, needing to, to have a metadata format, but uh, of course, to make it interoperable, we would need that. And the other thing I wanted to note is that, like, 
uh, for our use cases, even this tabular data can can be super big. Um, can have uh, even for for individual neurons in an EEM, they can have millions of of nodes or something. Um, so you wouldn't want to download them as CSV at any time. So it, I think, I mean, a core strength of of, of ZAR and NGFF is that you can stream data, and I think that also needs to hold for for tabular uh, information that you attach to that. Uh, yes, uh, Ibuke. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Yeah, no, it's perfect. <laughs> it's Ibuke. Yeah, and um, so I cringed a bit when uh, Josh mentioned CSV tables, and <laughs> I think this is a bit more the discussion for the metadata bit of the meeting as well. But definitely, I think, I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to host um, tables in the OMI and GFF. Um, uh, because then you can have uh, all the related metadata and in terms of integrating, say you were giving the example of, you know, segmentation annotations or um, things like that and um, displaying them on top of the images. Um, I think it's, uh, again, um, a great opportunity to be able to hold those together in the same sort of container. Um, in OIMI and GFF. And then, you know, like, um, I sort of agree there may be like many different things that can be held and not that all the viewers would support all different um, type of um, data that are held in the tables, but yeah, there can be um, some basic information displayed um, about what um, the table holds um, in the metadata. And, um, and then if the user wants to use their own scripts, whatever, then they can have some export tools to dump that table into a different format. But it kind of, um, in terms of metadata, I think it is, much preferable um, to have it um, in the OMI and GFF, I would say. Thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I think my biggest concern with going down this tables road is understanding what at what stage we're talking about using this form. Right. Because if we're talking about using it during the analytical process, so for example, as the destination of the outputs for segmentation or analysis, those use cases are very different. Right. Uh, potentially multiple writers updating the table in, in line, all of this kind of stuff. Right. Um, and those are not really specification level concerns. They, they are infrastructure level concerns, right? Um, and even chunking tables and all of this kind of stuff uh, are actually really tricky things if you want to, for example, add a column to the table or append rows or any of this, uh, any of these things. So, you know, and then thinking about all the storage backends we just talked about, trying to access things over HTTP, trying to access them from JavaScript and Python and Java. Etc. It's actually it's a it's a huge implementation and specification burden, right? Um, so I would be really careful about trying to also then prescribe how one uses the tables, <laughs> right? Um, in addition to all that, doesn't mean we shouldn't maybe try to do that, but having that be part of the core core specification is a really tricky place to be. Right, um, because then it puts that implementation burden of supporting all of these potential ways on every viewer and every consumer of the data. Right, um, so you know, I know we're all in. You know, some a lot of us are really interested in publishing the data and having the final results and having everything be well annotated. But we've also got a, one of the goals of of doing this is helping people during the actual scientific process. Right, and you know, we shouldn't forget about um, those those use cases and those those paths, right? Because uh, it's really easy to think about, hey, once you've nicely cleaned the table and I don't have to update it again, et cetera, 
most of the modeling we've done now is essentially on static data. It's not changing, right? Um, almost all the original image data, we set the metadata once and then you know we don't ever update it again. We don't change any of that JSON, right? The only place we might do this is you know adding a few labels, but even that is problematic, right? If you have multiple writers for those labels, et cetera, or you have multiple different storage backends for those labels. So, you know, I, I think we're gonna have lots of these discussions over as people start using this stuff for for more things, but um I'd be really careful about trying to prescribe visualization criteria when we haven't even settled on how all of the storage backends are going to be handled. Yeah, I just Norman. Sorry. Yeah, I, th I think you're raising very interesting points there. I think um the the, the main value of of OMI and JFF is an interchange format, and it doesn't need necessarily need to be the format that you actually store and use for uh, when you're creating these uh, analyses, right? So, um, the, the the issues you raise with like multiple writers or something could be an implementation detail of of any tool that. Uh, produces them, and then it could still output them as a compatible uh, OMI and JFF table or something like that. Um, but but yeah, I I've, I mean I fully agree that this is a very complex undertaking and um, probably not the best thing to uh, prototype in a specification, but first to prototype in like with real data and real tools, and then see what works. Yeah. Definitely agree, Norman. I think the only thing I'd add to that is I certainly and Glencoe Software cares very much about what happens in the middle, right? Um, if we can't we solve the problem, if we can't, if all this is an, is an interchange format and I still have to solve the problem for the scientific process and I've got to deal with that and I've got to build a file format and do that, why am I worrying about the interchange format then, right? It's like we've we've still got to handle we still all collectively, we've got to help that process. If the answer to that process is still CSV files on disk, TIFFs and all that, then like, why why are we just doing that in the interchange format? It just seems kind of silly, right? Uh, go ahead, Jason. You know, just very quick comment and without disagreeing at anything Chris just said, absolutely, but yeah, we have these kind of, I think you're sort of laying out very interesting. We have this sort of two sets of use cases, public data, and you called it scientific data analysis, Chris. And yes, it, there's a tension there. It, um, I wonder, is it, I know we're right at the top of the hour, so I'll just, I'll say this quickly, but if, you know, are there other, exam, other examples where fields have grappled with this, you know, basically a specification won't solve all the problems. And so, okay, we just put, you know, we put everything on this one side, we all sort of collectively agree uh, we, we didn't solve that problem, but we'll work here if only to have a way to get to, to have that public data or you know that one use case done. I, I know that's highly unsatisfactory for a lot of reasons, and those of us you know working both sides of the problem not be happy with that. But anyway, thanks. I think some people have to go now, so thanks all for Josh put it already in the chat for. Thanks all from all of us for the very useful feedback and comments. And I just put it in the chat. Christian Tischer, who's developing Mobi, will be joining us this afternoon. It's, I, when he registered, I assume he was here in the morning, but he it, it didn't. So we'll have a, a better demonstration of what Mobi is capable than the one I <laughs> attempted to, to do. And do that. there's also, I said this afternoon, uh, Matt McCormick, who's developed uh, ITK. Uh, viewer which also support OMSR, so we'll be there for to do a demonstration. Unfortunately, we didn't have anybody um, available to demonstrate NeuroGlancer, uh, which is which is another tool in the list. So, I think thanks all, and uh, thanks again for everybody for doing the demonstration and the valuable uh, discussion and. See you later on today if you wish to join us again at four o'clock UK time. Bye bye.